Oh, look at that guy right there. <laughs> hey, <laughs> <hold on. laughs> That's awesome. What's up, man? Welcome. I love this. This is about the coolest way to come into somewhere. It's, it's just, hey, don't say hi. It's just on. We're, we're going right into this. That's right. Yeah. Coffee's going to kick in just nicely. <laughs> Make yourself at home. Hopefully, it's right in time with my five-hour energy I had. Earlier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so ready. Oh, you got a lot of people in here. Yeah, well, well you it know, takes a few folks to to put this together. I love so, this. Yeah. you like it? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, we used to podcast in this little space right here, and okay. this where we're sitting used to be a souvenir shop. We still have a little souvenir shop over here, but when I retired, we sold half the souvenirs. <laughs> so we had to, we had this space to use. Yep. We turned it into a uh, we turned it into a nice cool studio. We're glad you're here, um, and I'm glad you brought Hovis. Uh, me too. Hovis is one of my favorites. Yeah. So you I've know? I have not. We could do an entire podcast on Hovis. You said not to believe <laughs> yeah. anything you said about. Well, it. that's because it's all it's believable. A, hey, Hovis is one of the original Junior Motorsports employees. As a matter of yes. fact, so yeah. Hovis, is he really? Yeah. How long ago was that? Yeah, a lifetime. So Hovis, uh, yeah, Hovis uh, works with Penske, I, you know, kind of gets you where you need to be, and, and he's the one that helped us sort of uh, set up this this uh, this podcast. But um, I'm so nervous. I feel like I'm, I'm like talking to the president or something. Shit. I don't know well, why. Mike's Mike's just a normal guy. You'll get used to it after <laughs> a, few, a few more minutes. Yeah, You'll realize no. very just intimidating. Like the, he's yeah. like the rest of us. Yeah. Well, no, this is uh, we we've wanted you in here for a long time so i don't want to add pressure to you but yeah. uh this is exciting to have you here man yeah. we do you i don't know where y'all met i remember when we first saw joseph and that was at the kentucky derby yes yep. that was the first time i think we met is that yeah. right yeah i think i we i got to interview you you did you inter yeah i don't i don't it was kind of a blur sort of, the whole thing you mean, right you were way busier than me that day, rightfully so <laughs> that day was bonkers i think i actually partied a little bit with my wife uh which i don't do very often but we had a blast yeah and um y'all look like y'all had a great time it was so much fun you know it's like going to the it's, you know like the daytona 500 or the indianapolis 500 it's one of those things you got to go see at yeah. some point so it was a really good excuse yeah so that was fun um and so ever since then i kind of been watching you and keep my on you um, but you're from Nashville, okay? Yes, sir. Born and raised in Nashville. Not right? really. Born and, no? born and raised, literally. Where, well, where is your family from? Um, so my mother is Danish. A lot of people don't know that because um, everyone just thinks I'm full American. I'm actually ha half Danish. My dad's from New York. Um, mostly grew up in, in Miami, though. And then they, m my family migrated to Nashville uh, with the family business. What so, is the family business? So my grandfather, he had a photography company. Um, they used to take, you know, school photos of, of kids all over the country, and then they based out of Nashville in the 80s. And so that's when my parents went up to Nashville. And then I was born in 1990, so I was born and raised there with my sisters and lived there until I was about 18 before I, you know, left the country to go racing in Europe. What did, um, so your, what, what were your early memories of racing? Like, why? So everybody's going to want to know, like, how you didn't end up becoming a stock car driver. You're in Nashville from Tennessee. All those things seem to point you in that direction, but you went overseas. So go back even before that. What was the first time you saw a race car of any kind and went, that's neat? Oh, it. I mean, probably when I was three years old. So I grew up watching racing on TV. That's how I was, like, that was it. acclimated Your to family it. Your you know? family had no... It's racing really my history? dad. No, no racing history. It's really my dad. Um, my grandfather was a big car guy too. So cars were always big in my family. Uh, my, my grandfather probably had a hundred cars at one point wow. in Whoa. his collection total. You know, big Chevy guy had all sorts of Corvettes um, and just all sorts of cars. Uh, but r really, I don't, I don't think he was the racing fan of the family. It was really my dad. My dad was the one that like pioneered liking racing, um, and he'd watch everything. He watched NASCAR. IndyCar, especially growing up in Miami, you know, when IndyCar was really big back mm -hmm. in the early 80s, he would watch street course races there. He'd watch Formula One on TV. So when I was growing up, it was really my dad that was watching racing. And I, I would watch it and be like, well, that's pretty cool. And yeah. I, I always loved anything motorsports related, anything that, you know, had an engine. I wanted a go-kart since I was two years old. And uh, I wasn't able to get one. My parents were really risk averse, which is kind of funny. Like they, my dad didn't want me to get into racing or do anything dangerous. Um, so he was really, uh, he pushed me more to play stick and ball sports. I played baseball, basketball growing up, 
but my love for racing came on TV. That's that's where I kind of grew up liking it. And I'd go with my dad to the track every now and then. Um, so there is racing love in my family, but there's no, you Got know, there's it. no yeah. anchor where it was like, hey, we went to the tracks every weekend, mm-hmm. and I grew up at the tracks. Like that's that wasn't my history. It was more watching it on TV. So wh- how did you get behind the wheel of your first race car? Like how did that happen? I, I have a really, I have probably an unorthodox story with motorsports. Um, so. Like I said, when I was younger, I always wanted a go kart. Ever since I was, you know, probably three years old, I wanted a go kart. Um, my parents were super against anything risky. I mean, it was hard getting a bicycle growing up, just because they didn't want me to get hurt. Um, so, you know, if you, I grew up in Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is, you know, not necessarily the the racing capital of the world. Um, it's hilarious actually, because Josh yes. Berry. We went to school together. Wow. Literally, what? Josh was in my seventh, eighth grade class. Are you serious? And we weren't even, I, I, I can't say, uh, hey, we were friends or anything, but like, I remember Josh. Wow. And <laughs> I wasn't racing at this point. I was probably 11, 12, you know, in seventh, eighth grade. And I just think it's hilarious now because I see right. what Josh is doing. I didn't even know Josh was racing or that he was a race guy. And it's probably four or five years ago, I started noticing like, I was like, oh, Josh Berry. I know Josh Berry. He was in my class. <laughs> oh my gosh! And then I I learned about his story. Like I had no idea that he moved over here and yeah. like you know he started working in the shop here and got to know you. Or I think he got to know you on iRacing, yeah. right? Then he came, moved over here. Like I know the story, and I'm like that is the coolest damn thing ever. Yeah. So I messaged him like four or five years ago, and I was like, hey, like I know we weren't friends or anything, but like I think it's so cool what you're doing. And just to see, I, he's got a way cooler story than me, <laughs> just because the way he had to work his way up right and now he's got the ride and everything and and you're doing so much to help him and he's worked for it uh i just love those stories so it's kind of a it's a weird world that that we grew up together i think this sort of does make hendersonville the cap the 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 racing capital because they you guys are born two months apart you and josh berry two professional race car drivers out of hendersonville tennessee from the same uh, class uh, in middle school (laughs) from the same class in middle what class was it uh i mean we probably i think we shared a bunch of classes I, i i remember I remember science class together for sure. Yeah, and probably. Neither uh, one of y'all probably paying much attention. No, pro- probably not. I, I just wish I could go back in time, you know, because I'm sure Josh was probably watching racing and like drawing cars in his book or something yeah. like. I had no idea. That. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> what you were doing yeah. in science class. <laughs> yeah. I was definitely drawing cars every class. So, okay, so keep going. You, yeah, you so, were in the middle of your story. That, so how do you? F- how did? How did you figure out how to get? You know. Are you, is there, when, when is the moment where you're sitting there going, man, I really want to try this? Here's how badly I wanted to do anything racing related was so Hendersonville, Tennessee, not a big racing place, right? I grew up playing baseball, basketball uh, since I was little, like three, four years old. Um, So I knew sports. I loved competition. I didn't realize how much I loved competition at that age, but I knew I wanted to tinker with something um, engine related or, or just, um, you know, motorsport related. I was like, just give me something I can drive. I want to do that. So I used to get my hair cut in this like strip mall area by this, you know, old school barber. His name was Rudy. Um, Cut my dad's hair, cut my grandfather's hair for like 30 years. Like, you know, it's the, you know, hometown barber. And next to the barber shop, um, one year opens up a skate shop and they start selling skateboards. And, you know, obviously I'm a young kid. I don't really I'm not doing much in Hendersonville, Tennessee, so I'm interested in the skateboard shop. And then I see in the window, they start selling these motorized scooters. Mm. I'm like, well, you know, my parents won't let me get a go-kart. Maybe, uh, maybe I can convince them to get me this motorized scooter. That's got an engine on it. Like, I could do something <laughs> with that. And so I think I, I convinced my mom for my, for my birthday, I really want that motorized scooter. Can you please give that to me? Um, and I got that for my birthday one year. Really? I think I was 12 years old. I got this motorized scooter... And I lived in a neighborhood in Hendersonville, Tennessee, and I literally convinced everyone in my neighborhood, all my pals, because that's what we did, you know, all summer long we'd hang out and terrorize the neighborhood. I convinced all my friends to get motorized scooters too. And so we had like six of these things, and we would race around the neighborhood, like (laughs) totally annoying the heck out of the neighbors, right? And and I would go back, I'd I'd have it in the garage, I'd take the engine apart a million times, put it back together. I, I loved it. And then I figured out, I loved this so much, and this was my, this was my only like window into racing was this motorized scooter. So I'm, I'm going to race this motorized scooter. I literally looked up online. that Back in 2001, there was sanctioned international scooter <laughs> racing. I swear, this is a real story. This is how I started motorsports. This is the weirdest thing ever. And I convinced my dad to take me across the country to race scooters. What does that uh, conversation start like? It's just, I mean, he knew. He's like, man, this kid really likes scooters and racing, and he liked racing too, so it's not like he didn't get yeah. it. But it was almost so silly. It was like 
Dad, if I, I'm literally asking you to take me to go race scooters in Las Vegas. Like, why can't we just get into go-karting? But anyways, we ended up doing that for like a year, and I raced these scooters How'd in like do? the world championships of scooter racing. You were that good. And I won. I won, won some events. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. So it got so stupid that it was Hold like... <laughs> what's scooter racing like? Tell us how, tell us how, what's the etiquette? Is there... It's like a cross between BMX racing and motocross, yeah. but on pavement. Like, they, they literally set up ramps. They set up obstacle courses. or Not obstacle courses. They set up... Um, How many are you competing against at once? Yeah, probably about 20 people in a yeah. class. And yeah. there's multiple classes, right? It's just like racing. You'll have... Is it set up in a parking lot, kind of like they do a lot of the cart stuff in Vegas? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you go to a casino. Yeah. They set it up. They cone it off. Yep. How fast would they go? I mean, the, the souped-up ones do, like, 35, 40 mile yeah. an hour. On a scooter, yeah, you know, it's like, what are we doing? Insane, yeah. <laughs> um, but it's, all these, you know, these these industries they form with just passion. You yeah. know, pe like people were passionate about racing scooters, yep. and you'd have like, you know, the hot shoes coming in with trailers. You know, we we'd roll up in the back of our truck with <laughs> with our scooters, um, but you'd have people with like semi trucks, just like racing. You'd have like, you want to beat these guys? These are the best of the West. Yeah, it's so silly. Um, so we did that for like a year. <laughs> And I think my dad was like, all right, let's go figure out how to get into racing. And I wanted to race go-karts. That was what was interesting to me. It's kind of what you know, caught my eye. Um, so eventually we got into that, and that's kind of how the, the story for racing starts. Yeah. And so your first go-kart, what, what kind of go-kart was it? Um, so, you know, um, for most people that probably don't know about karting, because a lot of people, I think, they think of um, – you know, typically they'll think of like going on vacation and seeing like a rental cart track or something right. like yeah. that's not the type no. of karting we're talking. We're yeah. talking about real kart yeah. racing. Um, what like, was your chassis? Oh man, it was an, it was an American Eagle, I think, is uh -huh. what it was called. It was like a one-off chassis. So Mark Dismore, who's an ex Indy car driver, um, started this this uh, this new go kart track in Indianapolis. Okay, um, you went. You're still living in Nashville. Still living in Nashville. And you're decide. You're you're gonna race in Indy. So this was really my dad. My dad goes, all right, you want to go racing? Let's figure out how we start this, right? You want to go go-karting? And he did all this research. He saw there was a new track being formed in Newcastle, uh, Indiana, which is about 35 minutes east of the city. And he said, this is a new facility. It's built by an ex indycar car driver. Uh, they have the largest um, cart distribution center in, in North America. Like They're literally the largest part supplier for go-karts in North America. Their company was called Comet Cart Sales. And he's like, let's go up here. We're going to meet these guys. They'll teach us how to race go-karts, and we'll figure this out. 300 miles to go to right. Indianapolis from Nashville, just up there, and then 300 miles back home. Mm. Uh, so my dad's a wild man. He's like, let's go do this. We, we met Mark. We met all these people. They, they sold us a, a go-kart. It was literally a one-off cart. I think it was called like an American Eagle yeah. or something. Um, sold us a Yamaha chassis, or uh, sorry, a Yamaha engine. And, um, and we bought the cart. We took it back home and started tinkering with it a little bit. And then that, that cart track officially opened. They were still building the track when we first went up there. Officially opened. And we're like, all right, let's go race. Let's figure out how to your race first, in their events. Your first cart race up there. Mm -hmm. And how old are you? 13 years old. And how do you know how to work on carts to make them go fast? You don't. I mean, you his, literally show his up. scooter skills. You're just working I, on I mean, scooters. <laughs> Yeah, it's all I mean, scooters, really, at the I end mean, of the day. It's taught me everything I know. It's the foundation of my success. You scooters. still apply scooter logic to well, your cars you today. you could. Right? I mean, you could to a go-kart. No, you you can no, 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 no. The go-kart engine and the scooter engine got to be pretty similar. Yeah, they are similar. I mean, it's the scooter engine is kind of funny. They're like little weed whacker engines, yeah. you know, like it literally, literally like from a lawnmower. Um, but there is similar <laughs> logic. You know, if yeah. you want to take the thing apart and, like, you yeah. know, put a new piston in or, like, you know, change the carburetors on it. It's similar to karting. I mean, Dale's right yeah. for sure. We're going straight to the scooter shop after this, aren't we, Dale? <laughs> this, we're doing that. No. This There's going to be an influx in scooter racing after this. Yeah. I, I've not told this story very often, but it's like the real why? story. Why? Well, why wouldn't you tell? This is a fascinating story. You know what the irony is? The irony is that your parents wouldn't let you get a bicycle because that's not safe. But the next thing you're doing is you got a Hemi and a scooter, basically, and you're Isn't going hilarious. You know, 40, yeah, forty miles an hour and winning. I think they created more of a problem. Like, you know, you hold someone back, and they're like, they just want it so much more because oh, you're, you're holding you're, them back. Oh, you're rebelling a little exactly. bit. Exactly. Yeah, I hear you. So you're, uh, you, go up to in, you go up to Indy to race this new track. Is that the, I mean, do you just race there for a while, spe specifically at that track? Or yeah, so when I started, um, kind of the easiest thing to do instead of trying to, you know, in go-karting, uh, the big stuff is national racing, right? And people, they'll travel, you know, all over the place, right? East Coast, West Coast, Florida, one weekend, you know, Chicago the next, North Carolina, 
Um, that's a lot more expensive because you're traveling all over the place. Well, this this new track, uh, Newcastle Motorsports Park, it it was going to create um, a destination for people of all, all of the Midwest to come to one location to race in this regional championship. It was the Kart Racers of America Championship. So I, to be economical about it, it was like, let's just race in this championship. We'll only come here. We can keep our go-karts here. They had garages built. It's much like GoPro Motor, Motorplex, yeah. you know? Mm. Um, very, very similar, but 15, 20 years earlier. Um, so it was like, this is going to be the most economical thing. We'll just race in this one championship, not try and do this national stuff. So I did that for about two and a half years before I got into car racing. And that was really my, that was my introduction into racing, you know, learning everything about racecraft, you know, how you work on a cart, how you work with the team, how you work with the mechanic, um, just, you know, how, how you be a race car driver. That's, that's the foundation right there. Yeah. So what are some of the, I guess, what are some of the, what are some of the things that you would have done differently? I guess, you know, cause you, uh, let me, this is a terrible analogy, but it's, it's the only one I can think of right now. But like when I got into cycling, right. Um, you're getting into racing at 13, you know, go-karting at 13 years old. <clears throat> that's pretty normal. I mean, when I started racing go-karts, I was 14, 15. Okay, know? yeah. I wasn't really, like kids today, it's ridiculous. It's nuts, yeah, right? It's ridiculous. Four or five, five years old. old. It just doesn't make any sense at all. But um, when I got into biking, which you probably ride bikes, right? Road bikes? A, a little bit. I, I'm not a roadie like all most right. guys. Well, I do, and I went head first. Made oh, no. tons of mistakes, right? All kind, bought all kinds of unnecessary things, and ended up having to turn around and sell on eBay. Um, <laughs> so, give me some, some. I got, you know, we're gonna pretend we got a thirteen-year-old standing right here. What are you gonna tell his dad on some of the advice, missteps, things you would have done differently? You know what? It's, it's. I'd like to say we'd do something different, but I don't think we would. Yeah. Mm. Because that's how you learn, right? Yeah. You know, and that's that's been the story of my whole career, and you, you really learn that in racing that. If you don't make the mistakes, it's hard to kind of figure out what you're supposed to do. What was the hardest thing for you to realize in racing? Um, you know, that it's not fair. It's not a fair sport, and uh, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, you keep going. I, I, that's, I, I, I got so mad at certain points because I didn't think things were fair, and that's in different ways, right, whether it's who gets the opportunity or – you know, the way the, the cars are built or the way they're set or the racing style of certain races. Oh, that's not fair. The way that they, they race because the fastest guy doesn't win. There's a lot of things in racing that you might not think are, are fair, but it, you've you got to work through them. I think it's all, it's racing is all problem solving. OK, and the more that you make that excuse that it's not fair, et cetera, it's you're not getting the point. It's figuring out the problem, whether that's figuring out the problem of how you get in the car or it's figuring out the problem of how you win this race around, you know, the people that you're racing against. So that's what I've had to probably learn. It's what I've gotten better at is, you know, being calm and the way that I look at racing and knowing that, yeah, it's not a fair sport half the time, but that's, that's really the challenge of what motorsports is. Mm. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a great point. When I see, um, you know, my sister got her little kids, her little girls and her son into the the karting stuff going on around here, dirt tracks and all that. And it, there's a lot of young kids, yeah. Brexton Bush, Kyle's son. And I think um, it's a great platform, like any at any age, probably was for you too at 13. But it, w when you start out, that's what it should be about, I think, is it molding that person you know that you know that impressionable child mold helping them understand how to lose yeah. how to accept getting beat man you got outrun today you know and we're not going to pitch a fit you know we're going to go over there and we're going to congratulate the winner and we're going to come back next week and we're going to have fun again you know yeah. and um i watch these parents today because i know i may go through that one day i might i don't know what my girls are going to want to do but uh and i'm trying to i guess learn uh, through all through Kelly's through all the kids that I go and watch them race and your experience trying to learn how to not turn into that sort of super competitive dad, right? And just and it be about wins and losses, right? It should be more about trying to help them turn into, into you know good individuals, like good people. Was your dad cognizant of that when he's taking you to the racetrack? Was he a is was he super you know competitive about you know y'all's racing? Uh, or was he helping you sort of um, grow as an individual? How was that going? I mean, my dad was my secret weapon, like in my whole career. I, my career would never happen, 
or have happened without my father and for multiple reasons. Um, and that's a good example of it is that my dad, he was the perfect temperament for, you know, how do you interact with your child at the track and how do you bring them up? You know, what kind of example do you lead? Explain, and, explain that a little bit on some things he did. He's a, he's a pretty competitive person. I'd say I'm probably more competitive now, um, but he's the eternal optimist. And that's his strength is that, you know, there was no challenge that was too big for my father. And he instilled that into me when I was young. You know, we, we're going to, we can figure out anything. You can do anything. Um, and it wasn't like this happy-go-lucky type of deal. It was, it was a determined optimism where it's like, you know, whatever challenges are in front of us, like we, we can make it happen. And he, and he believed in me probably before I believed in myself that I could become a professional race car driver. It's a little bit cheesy, but he's just... He had that right temperament where, you know, he, w he was intense in some ways. Uh, he wanted me to, you know, he really wanted me to learn. He wanted me to have the best environment possible. But he was also really hands off a lot of the times. He let me make my own mistakes. And I was pretty, you know, clear with him in the beginning that that's how I wanted it. I really did as a kid. I wanted to, I wanted to learn and make the mistakes myself. You know, I, if there was a mechanic that I was working with, I didn't want my dad to work with the mechanic. I, let me work with the mechanic. Let me understand how we're supposed to interact and, you know, get a flow together. Um, and those are little things that you don't really even think about when you're, when you're young. You know, I think if you're a parent, you just want, just give my kid the best. Let me protect him. Let me, let me be the hand that's over him, making sure he's got everything right at the right moment. And he did that to some degree, but was also completely hands off and letting me, you know, take care of things. So he was not this overbearing, you know, figure. If I lost, yeah, of course, you know, it's disappointing for him, but he didn't display it as in that's unacceptable or this is disappointing. It was, well, let's, let's, you know, focus on why we lost and, and let's, let's make it right and win the next race. And that's how it was. So yeah. he was the real, he was the perfect temperament, I think, as a, as a parent. And his optimism and his attitude not only helped shape me and in, in who I am and how I interact at the track with the people around me, but he, he was also the person that just kept carrying the torch and like getting us up the road. I mean, I would never have made it up these steps. And you guys know how this is. There's a lot of steps you got to work to get to the top of the mountain. And then when you get to the top of the mountain, it's like you start all over again, right? Because it's a new mountain at the top. Um, but I would never have made it up those steps without, without my dad and his determination. So when you're trying to compete in the go-karts, um, I, I remember um, going to my first race and remember my first accident. It was spectacular. Um, <laughs> and it was, uh, it, was, it was a wild experience. Um, so you, you know, and you mentioned how your parents were, were uber you know, worried about your, you know, your safety growing up as a kid and didn't, you know, wanted to try to protect you at all times. Um, so you have your, what's your first big crash? What is that experience like with your dad? And, uh, what was your thought process going through that? Cause that's like the first test, right? Mm -hmm. Um, is how you react to not only getting outran or, or being not being, not being the best in that moment, but that big moment where you crash and that, yeah. that you get that real fear. So for me, it was really the first uh, car race that I did. It wasn't in go-karts. You know, go-karts was kind of its own category. Um, and, you know, we had some wrecks in that. But, you know, if you take go-karting out of it, we did that two and a half years. And then when I was 15, 16, I started getting into car racing. What kind of cars? Skip Barber is where we went. Okay. It was the most economical yeah. thing. Skip Barber Racing, back in 2006, they still had the national championship, regional championships, and it just made a lot of sense from an economic standpoint. That was the easiest transition. It was the cheapest transition yeah. to get into formula cars. Um, so I, I went down. I got taught how to drive an open-wheel car. You do a three-day school. Where at? And this was uh, – where did I go? I think it was um, Daytona. Yeah. Actually, it was actually Daytona. So mm. it's funny you say that because um, – this sounds silly, but – the skip car, Skippy car is my favorite car on our racing, and I've often wondered. Really? Yeah, I just love it. It's so much fun. Um, it moves around a lot too. It does move around a lot, and I don't know how realistic that is. And but very realistic. Yeah. It seems just like a car that just teach you so much, and uh, like you said, it's pretty relatively easy as far as getting involved in. Um, and I remember being at Daytona and watching the schools happen on the infield course. They had like a small version of the infield course, and they just had cars going and going. And all these young guys getting in and out of them with their with their nice you know their new helmets and um, so you were the, one of those guys you yeah were, you were in there grinding away trying to get your so when you go to Skip Barber right and you show up for this three day school is it an automatic that you're going to get this uh, you know you're going to get your application into the series 
or how, what is the school about? What is that process for? So you have like a mix of people coming to these schools, right? right? You got young kids coming out of go-karts that are supposed to be the new hot shoes, and you've got 35-year-olds that worked their whole life just to save up enough money to come and do this school, oh, man. right? Yeah. You know, so you got a you got a range of people that are there, and you got like twenty something year olds that maybe, you know, they're they're probably a, a little too old to get into racing, but they still believe they can do it. Um, so there's a range of people, uh, but really it's just, you know, back then Skip Barber was all about if you want to drive a race car and you want to be taught how to drive a race car, that's where you go. It's mm-hmm. pretty economical. I think it was. You know, twenty five hundred bucks maybe for a three day school, maybe three thousand bucks. Uh, so it's still expensive, yeah. but in the grand scheme of everything, like you know, someone can can save up and afford that um, at some, maybe some point in their life. So yeah, you go to school and they teach you the three day school. It's all the basics, and then if you you do well in that, then you go to the two day advanced school, and that's like the real race cars. You know, they put some wings on it. They give you the sequential gearbox um you have to qualify or something for that i, I mean like can anybody to, go to the t- two-day school i think you had you had to run the three-day school and show that you were proficient enough to go to the two-day yeah. they could turn you down they though. i think they could yeah, yeah. if you were like man okay. this guy's really not good maybe yeah. he needs to go three-day again <laughs> one more time okay. there was cases okay. like that so yeah you run through the school and then at that time it was like you know if you if you got through the two s- schools then you go race the regional championship and there was a couple of those. There was like a South Championship. Uh, what does the championship consist of? Um, so it was like 10 races. You'd go to Daytona, Sebring, Moroso, like all sorts of places in yeah. Florida on the South Championship. Are those companion races to major events like IndyCar and so forth? Um, no, it was uh, there were standalone. Really? Yeah, you'd go there, and they were, they were standalone races. You were the deal. Yeah, we were – Skip Barber racing yeah. was happening. Right. Here, you know, come check it out. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you continuing to have to fork over money, though, to continue to advance? Or are yeah. you still riding your – Twenty five hundred, three thousand dollar entry. No, so yeah, I mean, it was still if you wanted to run the whole South Championship, the cars, was, the cars were all prepared for you, right? Yeah, it's the, so they're running it. That's why it was economical because yeah. it was a school. You know, the the scale of it was easier. I think it was. I mean, it still probably cost ten, fifteen grand yeah. to run that whole championship. Did you feel like the cars were equally prepared? No. I, it, it's best they could be, right? You know, these are older chassis. Was it random which car you were going to get per race? It was random, yeah. But then, you know, you start looking into, well, who are the mechanics, you know, and what mechanics are working on what, and do you have a mechanic buddy, and, you oh. know, who tests the cars? Yeah. Well, who's the test driver? You know, can I talk to the test driver? Which one did you like the most? What balance on the car did you like could the you most? Could you adjust anything on the cars yourself? No, other than brake bias. I think brake bias yeah. was, was manually adjustable. Um, but they were... Pr- I, I don't want to. No, no, no. They were pretty. It equal was a great series. Yeah, yeah, they did a good job. I mean, it, they were as equal as you could make yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You know. So how did that go? How did that experience go? So my very first race. To go back to your question yeah. on that Wrecking. big wreck. Yeah. It's my first race. I went through the schools. <laughs> All right. I'm at I'm at Sebring. You know, the full course. Oh it's, my it's god. A pretty daunting yeah. course. Have you ever been to Sebring? It was very tough. Uh, turn 17. I destroyed a Corvette there. Did you? Yes, I did. What corner? Uh, in the bridge, like uh, turn yeah. three. Yeah. Hit the, yeah. I backed into the bridge. That'll happen. Testing, yeah. Yeah, it'll yeah, happen. It It'll wild. bite you that place. <laughs> That's what makes it fun. It's the bumbling. damn what, tires, What, what man, car were slick. you driving there? Me and Dad went to test the Corvettes to oh. get ready for Daytona, and they're like, you know, the tires are a little, eh, for a lap, take it easy. I mean, <laughs> I barely touched the throttle coming out of three, and it goes, we, and I feel like I'm going 30 mile an hour. Yep. I feel like I'm crawling, and the next thing I know, I feel like I'm going 100 mile an hour backwards, Yeah. and I hit that bridge, and I thought, Okay, I've junked this thing, and they put it back together in 15 minutes. Oh, there you and they're go. They're like, here you go, and I'm like, me again? Uh, you sure? <laughs> I get to stay. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they're keeping me. But anyhow, you so, you're turn brain. 17 for you. It's a very, very difficult place. So very difficult. Yeah. Very bumpy. Yeah. Um, very quick. Like turn 17 is super fast. You know, you're entering off the back straight and you know hauling the mail into the corner, and then it, you go under a bridge there too. There's a lot of bridges at Sebring. Um, so it's my first race. And um, in that first race, I just lost the car into turn 17 and pancaked it into the wall. And it was like my first really big wreck. And I just thought, you know what? Like in that moment, it, re- it really made me think, you know, why am I doing this? I don't know why, but that, that was the one wreck that sticks in my mind where it knocked my confidence. Mm. And I really thought, like, I-, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know that I can do this for a living. Mm. I, you know, and, and that's when you're young, you start to think about that mm. at that point. Like, is this something I want to pursue? And am I good enough to do that? And that wreck completely knocked that confidence out of me. My dad was there. We had dinner that night. And I just remember him, again, the temperament, you know. He just really encouraged me to 
I had a race the next day too. It was a two, two race weekend. And this happened on that first race. And he just encouraged me to go out and, and, you know, try again tomorrow, you know, not to let this set me back. And, um, I, I remember that. I remember that night so vividly to me. We, I mean, we were at dinner, and I was like, I just wanted to go home. I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't think I can. Yeah. Um, I, I can't believe how to look at myself now and then to think back to that. I can't believe how little confidence I had. Um, but you know, him being the right temperament and forcing me to go the next day was the right thing. I ended up winning the next day. Wow! I won the race. All right. And so the contrast between those two days was a real inflection point in my career because from from that point on when I won that race the next day it was it was never a lack of confidence again yeah. regardless of what happens mm. so I think it was a really important lesson for me to learn defeat or give yourself humility that you know what you're going to make mistakes and and sometimes in racing that's half the battle is to have that confidence and humility that you know it's okay to wreck the car it's it's going to happen I mean yeah. it's just going to happen at some point professionals wreck all the time um, so I think that was a really important lesson for me mentally to understand how to, you know, survive in racing. Yeah. I think that, um, that was one of the things that unfortunately is, um, it doesn't change about racing is a, you know, the highs and lows and they will come one right after the other. Uh, and fortunately for you, the high was the second thing, you know, the, the, the disappointment of the day before. Um, but that was one thing that never changed. I don't care how, you know, even in the Cup Series, you would win, and then the next week could be one of the worst weekends where just nothing's going right, and they're literally running in the back of the pack with no understanding of why, how you could be so good and then so bad. Um, but, you know, what he says is, is interesting because while he's talking about confidence, I mean, you guys, I don't care what you're racing, when you've lost your confidence – you can tell just just normal people can tell that you're not as fast, right? I mean, like you, people don't they slow down when they lose their confidence. How did you get it's your everything. confidence back? It's everything. Oh, you're ta- you said your dad. It's because your dad you got your confidence back, right? Yeah, hundred percent. In that moment, it was it was through my father, kind yeah. of channeling you know his energy um, and just his demeanor. That's what. But you know, from that moment on, it kind of taught me how to how to self regulate that because it it is everything. And I mean, I'm a huge believer in that in sports in general too oh yeah i mean it's 100 you know, i remember confidence is so critical and it's not a cockiness no i mean some people can be cocky about it but the the true belief in yourself the true belief yeah and the ability to work through multiple situations confidence is like at the cornerstone of anything when you're when you're peaking performance wise you know even if you're not a cocky person or individual inside you have that internal confidence that's driving it it's just – it's so critical in so many different ways in racing. I and mean, you can dive into the different ways confidence um, helps you, but it is it is like the most important thing to, I think, kick butt in racing. I remember early in Dale's career, he used to say, you know, I'm the best driver out there. And and then he would say, I, you got to think that. If you're going to go out there and race, you, you got to think that you are the best one out there. And he was – you, you, were, you were winning, you know, four, five, six races a year. When we went through 2009 and 10 at Hendrick – you weren't saying that anymore. And, man, I remember his confidence was so low <laughs> yeah. that it – I mean, like, it, it was almost uh, like depression low, right? And, man, I was like – that's when I saw the stark difference between, man, where's that – I'm the best driver out here. And now it's like, man, you're just – you know, I remember the race where they, they kept you out uh, and, and uh, let you – you know, you were leading laps. Lance kept you out leading laps at Charlotte, but – not pitting with everybody out. And you're like, what is this what it's come down to? You know, you <laughs> just try to keep me out here on old ass tires. I'm not going to hold them off. And I'm like, man, what I'd give to have that confidence back. Cause we, you know, that right there is, is everything right. So it's uh, critical. Yeah. yeah. And I've had those moments too. Like, you know, in it, it does, it coming, it comes and goes. Um, I had it in the beginning of my, my IndyCar career where, you know, it wasn't the confidence knock that I had in, uh, that very first Skip Barber race, it wasn't like that. Yeah. It wasn't a, it was more just like a depression where, you know, it, it was my first year, it was my rookie year in IndyCar and you know, nothing went right. And we were a small team, just didn't have the budget, the testing. Um, I was, just, it was just me. I had no teammates, no real idea on how to drive the car or what to look at to drive the car well. Um, so I felt like on an island and I, I more so got depressed. That was like the lack of confidence was yeah. just, you know, feeling defeated. You know more than it. it wasn't that. Oh, I don't. I don't believe in myself anymore. It's just you know why am I doing this? I, I don't know that I can. I don't know that I can make enough of a difference to to warrant being here. That was mm. more what it what it felt like. But you can go through those different moments. It's 
You know, it's it's really a team sport when you look at confidence, uh, especially at the top level. You know, it, everyone's got to buy into it, and you you're feeding off every individual in that team. Um, and if there's like a broken link somewhere, then it can it can affect the whole group. Um, and when that starts to happen, it's just it, nothing good comes out of that. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned earlier that you were overseas racing. So how did you end up over there? So uh, so Skip Barber went through that whole process. And then um, throughout racing in Skip Barber, I got selected for this scholarship. It was called the Team USA Scholarship. It was created by a guy named Jeremy Shaw. He was a, he was a writer. He's actually English. And he created this, this USA Scholarship. And he wanted to bring young Americans uh, over to, to, to Europe mostly England, um, to race in that environment and showcase American talent. And this was started, I think the very first year was 1990 or maybe it was 91. I probably don't have my years right. Um, and they went over with Jimmy Vassar the very first year uh, from, yeah, it was an IndyCar driver, Jimmy. And um, they've had, you know, multiple guys. So Almondinger was a winner of it one year. And it's a really good scholarship, you know, that's funded by individuals within racing. And they send these, you know, they send a kid or two kids over and they, they race in some premier racing championships over in Europe. For me, it was the Formula Ford Festival um, that they sent us to go race in. That's like a huge deal in England. If you're, you were Ayrton Senna, Michael Schumacher back in the 70s, 80s, like that's where you went to go prove yourself in Europe as a, as a junior uh, driver before you, you know, moved up the ranks to go to Formula One. So the Formula F Ford Festival was a big deal. No American had ever won it. Um, and when I went over there, I won, I won the festival. I was the first American. I'm still the only American that's ever won that race, which is kind of shocking. At Brands Hatch? At Brands Hatch, yep. So cool. One yeah. of the full course or the indie course? Indie course. Man, I love the indie course. Do you? It's so fun. I like the full course really? more. Yeah. I mean, I run it and enjoy it, but the indie course is so short track. Yeah, you know, I love short track racing, right? Same. And uh, that to me is kind of such a short course. It's it, it begs for you know you to be aggressive. And I used to watch a lot of British touring car racing. Really? Yeah, because they <laughs> race. I would never have they guessed that. The, they knock the mirrors <laughs> off, right? They yep. run hard and beat yep. and bang. And I got to be a big fan of like Jason Plato and Matt yeah. Neal and those guys. When Plato was dominating, right. probably yeah. yeah. And Matt was an independent back, you know, running with the big boys. It was fun, but um, so I fell in love with uh, Brands Hatch. Have you ever gone never there? Never been. No. Oh, you gotta Such go. A, it looks like an awesome place. Yeah, and I'm with you. I love short track racing. Has actually become probably my favorite form of racing. So I respect that on the indie side. But for Brands, the full GP course. If you're a road course racer, it's like one of the coolest circuits oh, in the yeah. world. So uh, yeah, I love that place. It was, uh, but that was a big win. And, and oh, yeah. Brands, and, and then it kept me over in Europe. So when I won that festival, um, did really well with the scholarship. That was kind of my door into racing in England and you know potentially going to Formula One, which is which is what I wanted to do initially. I was really captivated by Formula One um, and wanted to try and make it over there. So what were you, what, you, you've talked about, <laughs> I can't even imagine like even thinking that I'd ever get a shot at anything like that. And how were you able to, you know, everyone wants to be a Formula One race car driver over in Europe particularly, you know, the, the – it's like musicians in Nashville, like in, you know, mm -hmm. everybody in Europe wants to race Formula One. All the guys that are racing anything over there want to get to that opportunity, right? And you really had a legit avenue, you know? Totally, With yeah. your success. Um, what, what, did, was there a moment where you were like, um, like, can, you could, could you believe your reality that you were, you were heading in that direction? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I had to pinch myself at moments. It's so cool what we were doing. You know, when we went over the, for the festival, it was like a three-week journey. It was probably the most fun I've ever had in racing was, was going over there. Uh, I went with another driver, Connor Daly. Uh, he was my teammate. <laughs> and we literally spent um, we spent three weeks together. We, went, we were in Ireland, England. We, we lived with this Irish family, that um, the Dempsey family. They were the ones that ran our Formula Fords. Um, and the Formula Fords are the coolest thing. It's like putting a Skip Barber car on steroids. Um, they move around a lot. Super fun to drive. You know, very good for car control and learning vehicle dynamics, especially mechanical yeah. grip. And um, so, yeah, we lived with this Irish family for three years in the in the truck and uh, just had a blast. Just had a blast testing the car, racing it. And so, yeah, in those moments, you think, wow, this is so cool. Like, we got selected for this really neat scholarship, you're, and maybe we can go to Formula One one day. You're, you're, you've been with your dad your whole life, right? And he's now probably not – he's, you know, obviously not in Europe with you, right? Yeah, pretty – I mean, they came, over, they came to, over to watch the race, but that was – yeah, that was probably the first moment where it was just – You. It was us. On your you own. Know? Yeah, it was me, and it was whoever I'm with, and 
we're trying to go racing. And that's kind of how they Jeremy wanted it, too. It's, it's pretty cool about the scholarship. Yeah. The whole idea was to put you out of your comfort zone. I know. Where are you uncomfortable? No, not at all. I mean, it, we were having the time of our lives. I was 17. You know, <laughs> Connor was 16. How did you stay focused? I, I, I loved racing. For me, it was easy. The environment was 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 a good, safe environment, and perfect. No, no, <laughs> no distractions. No, I mean, you know, in in. I'm just Ireland, trying to imagine. In, you know, I couldn't imagine me at 17 in Europe. Well, you, I would have torpedoed the hell out of that. Yeah, the funniest, the funniest <laughs> thing. People know Connor Daly now. He was the complete opposite. What? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, the Connor Daly you see today, I'm like. He was the opposite when he was in Europe. He was like the most. He was quiet. He was. He was. He played video games. He was nerdy. Um, super cool <laughs> guy. Happened? One of my best friends. I know what happened to him. I, I he well. So we, he went back to Europe after yeah. that two years later, and then he came back home to America, and he was like, <laughs> "I was like, what happened, man? You're like, you're like an international superstar now. You're not the Connor <laughs> Daly I yeah. knew." Um, but yeah, we were, you know, we were just nerdy little kids that were 16, 17. All we cared about was racing. Yeah. So, you know, any of the Irish influence of let's go to the pub and get some pints, uh, that yeah. wasn't a problem. How was the, how were you able to get up to speed at all these unique tracks that you'd never seen in your life? That, I, I think that was one of my skill sets. So when I, when I did the festival right up to speed right away, Connor was too. Connor was really on it as well. Um, but that was one of our skill sets. We could rock up and just be quick mm-hmm. right away. And a lot of people were mm-hmm. like, what the heck are they doing? Are they are they cheating with these American drivers? Because they hadn't really seen that before from a lot of others. Um, but yeah, it was part of the skill set. And then I stayed over in Europe after that in 2009, ran the full British Formula Ford Championship. Coolest year of my life, just traveling all over England and, and Ireland. Um, and I had to learn all those tracks. There was probably you know 20 different tracks that I went to and didn't know anything about them. And that was the skill set was to like be on it right away and you know learn them super fast and be up to speed with the locals pretty much. Mm-hmm. So what was it like racing um, and being the only you know being pretty much the only American in the series? Like, are you? Um, did they so like when we see you know when you see guys out on the racetrack you treat them a little bit differently. One of the th- one of the things that's unique about IndyCar now that it's multinational. I never even thought about that until I went to the Indy 500, and I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, the personalities. It's like this smorgasbord of all it's kinds. It's surprising. Of, yes, it's a little bit shocking because I'm so used to NASCAR, man. Yeah, he's from Indiana. He's from California. Yeah, everybody's from – most people are from the United States. And um, and you kind of you kind of know what you're going to get from everybody. Yeah. But um, when you went to Europe, did, were you – was it tough getting that respect? Was it easy to get? Were they was, was everybody welcoming you with open arms? Come on in, have some fun. Yeah, I think for the most part it was really welcoming. Um, so you can kind of think of the British Formula Ford was much like NASCAR. It was mostly British people. Uh-huh. You're either English or Irish or Scottish. Um, you're British. Yeah. Um, and so I was really the only outsider. There wasn't a lot of Europeans. There was, maybe, I think, there was like one Dutch guy. Actually, there was. He was my teammate. He was Dutch. Um, but I, I liked it because, you know, people, people were very friendly, warm and opening and welcoming my team for the most part. Like I had the the best, sweetest team from England. They had this, you know, really cool shop that was on their farm, literally in a barn in their uh, farm. Old school. Oh, so yeah. cool. It's literally like, you know, short track racing in North America, yeah. uh, but in England oh. uh, with Formula Fords. That's how, you know, cause they don't really do late models and stuff over there, but sure. Formula Ford racing is what they do. Um, so it was so much fun, but I, I was for sure the underdog, you know, people don't want right. to see the American come in no. and race against all the British and kick their butt. But I, I loved that. I was like, this is so cool. Mm. Everyone does not want to see me succeed probably. And that makes me really want to succeed. It just gives you extra motivation. Yeah. You know, you're the, you're the outsider in that whole group. So your, your, your eyeball is on, your eyes are on Formula One. Um, how do you end up? getting back to the states so i think europe and the path to formula one is probably the most probably the most political environment i've ever seen i mean formula one is like just this goliath of political uh uh, it's just politically difficult you know you've got like high high money people in that sport i mean you're talking two three hundred million dollars for a team with these manufacturers mercedes ferrari i mean that's serious money you've got 
you know, oil money from the Middle East and you've got these large corporations in Europe. I, I've just never seen such a politically um, intrinsic sport where it was like, you have to have the right connection. You have to have the right manager. You have to be on the right team. You have to know exactly what engines you need to have for this series. It's so cutthroat and difficult. I don't even know how you explain that to a young racer now. Mm. And it's only gotten worse. Yeah. It was even easier back when I was doing it. Now it's got even harder. Um, so you start looking at this and, and the British Formula Ford was the easiest part because there was none of that. It was just like short track racing in North America. Like if you have a good shop and a good team, you guys can go compete with whoever, right? It didn't matter. Like you can do a good job. Um, but then when you get through British Formula Ford and you're like, all right, let me, let's go up the rung and the ladder. Let's get to the next level in Europe and then maybe get a shot to Formula One. That's where it gets tough. You start really going to Europe and you're like Formula Three or, you know, GP2 at the time. Now it's F2. Those are really political and trying to get just the money and the right team and the right manager to even get an opportunity to maybe talk to a Formula One team is like the most difficult thing ever. So I ran out of funding for the most part. I went, I went and ran GP3 in 2010, which is the year after British Formula Ford. And I just we just got the opportunity to put together. I was supposed to run Formula 3 in England, and I had an investor that was going to invest in me, literally backed out at the last minute. I was sitting in the car ready to test it for the first time. Check doesn't clear. Oh, no. That guy goes away and, like, disappears off the face of the planet, which I really needed in, in order to run the car. Um, so then I got this opportunity, last moment, run GP3. We ran all over Europe following Formula 1. Worst year of my career. Um, definitely out of money after that. That was the end of 2010. Thought my, was, my career was over. My dad had to come back over to England, help me pack up, bring me back to America. And I literally thought, I was like, we're out of money, probably all done. My, my, my dreams of going to Formula One have just crashed and right. died. So, you know, this is over. So we came back to America, and then the story continues after that. What's the rest of it? So uh, Okay, so, <laughs> so when I come back to America. So, all right. Are you, I mean, I'm, you're framing this up. You're... You feel like that you've so I've had I think a lot of drivers can re relate to that feeling of I think this is it yeah I've, that was that was it I'm done what am I gonna do next I gotta I gotta do a normal thing right I gotta what job am I gonna do right yeah you got a family business to to maybe uh, go get involved in um, well and the family business was now you know they they had sold it oh. in 2008 so it wasn't around anymore oh so. and I mean I really at that time I was thinking. You know, maybe I go to college, you know, maybe I get a degree in something. Yeah. Um, oh, Lord. <laughs> I don't know what degree I want to get. You know, I, I it's, it's like you get so focused on. Not that that's a bad thing, Mike. No, no, no. no. Yeah. I go, but if you're, if that's your starting point at 18 to now, okay, so I have to go get you're a degree. 18. Where no, do I you start? I'm, I'm just, I'm almost 20. I'm 19. Yeah. You're 20. Yeah. That, that, yeah. usually you've started thinking about that before then. So, yeah, it would be a rough transition to, have to uh, start considering. It's just a hard pill to swallow. It's you know? it, right, right, you, right, right. You, you kind of go your whole career, um, which you know for me at that point was like three, four years. Yeah, I think the only the part that would be most difficult for me is, and I think this listeners should contemplate this a second, is when when people when if you're a aspiring race car driver running short tracks around here or whatever, you run into these obstacles, you run into these dead ends. But it's here, and it, and and it you're, is is you know people people that lose their rides or or when their opportunities drop they they show it up at the track they keep their helmet and they 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 keep persevering out of sight out of mind right but you can always you know be at the next race and make yourself available yeah right and it's it but when you're in Europe right. And your in your your deal ends. Or you've ran into that roadblock. You you don't you don't bring that resume back. Like no one no one over here knows really what you've been doing over there. Maybe some of the important people do, and that's probably the rest of your story. But I'm just I can't imagine how uh, fearful you must have been of your future because if you have those roadblocks, stumbling blocks at 20 years old here. Uh, you you kind of can recover, right? But when it ends there overseas, and you got to come all the way back to the states, you have you're not coming back to a foundation. You're not coming back to anything, right? Yeah, it's a good point. You put all that sweat equity there over there, and when that's when you leave that continent, right? You come back here. You got to really start from scratch, right? Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. It's that was really the case. But exactly to what you alluded to, some of the important people that 
you know, pay attention to kind of the overall picture. They still keep tabs and they see what's going on. Um, and they know of some of these guys that maybe went and did those, these forays. So that's what led to 2011. I got a, an amazing opportunity. The, the, I mean, Indy Lights was so expensive. So I'm Indy Lights, the feeder series to Indy right. car. You know, this is like running an Xfinity to Cup. It's so expensive to go run Indy Lights. I mean, it was nearly a million bucks to run that championship. Um, and, you know, I mean, we didn't have enough money to run the year before. We didn't have any money. So I don't know, I don't know how you're going to go conjure up a million bucks, you know, in yeah. a couple months to go run Indy Lights. So I got basically given a lifeline by Sam Schmidt, who owned one of the most successful Indy Lights teams. They, they were the cream of the crop at the time. They call you up? And they called me up, and they, he basically did a deal for me. He invested in my career, too. What did he say? He said, you know, what was it that you had done that they were so interested in? Well, they had been keeping an eye on it, and, you know, we had some other people around us and keeping them in the loop, and basically Sam was like, you know, we'll, we'll take a flyer on you. And he was, he was pretty savvy in Indy Lights. Like, he actually had legitimate sponsorship on some of his cars. Okay. One of his cars was fully funded. So he could pick and choose the driver. He could he pick and choose the driver. That car was taken. <laughs> The funded car. But then he had this other car that was like maybe going to be funded. And so he, he basically invested into my career and said, you know, I want some you know, future of you, um, and I'll put you in the car. And we still had to pay a little bit of money, mm -hmm. but we found the money. And it was like, all right, we can put up some of it. No way we can get all of this, but we can, we can get some of it. And we didn't run with we, – we didn't even pay for, for crash damage insurance, which is a big no-no in Indy Lights. You wreck a car in Indy Lights, it's like a $150,000 hit just like that. And so you and took that chance. We took that. We had to. Yeah. It was that we couldn't do anything else. So I got in the car. We raced that championship. I won the very first race out, and I went up winning the championship. And the, then I get an opportunity in IndyCar from. So it. when you go out and you win the first race, um, how did the conversations or the how did the how did the like all the crash the current you know you're, you you do, do you carry the concern with the crash damage into that first race are you thinking your dad's thinking about that right no it was on the dad yeah not you yeah. yeah um and so you go out and you win sam uh is what's the conversation like then at that point like hey let's you know no it's on i think you know for those guys they didn't expect you know they they wanted to give me the opportunity if they didn't feel i was going to be a contributor and be good for their yeah, ecosystem sure. But I, didn't, I don't think they expected me to be sort of the, the leader of the team. That was supposed to be the other car, the fully Who's funded the car. Guy? It was Esteban Guerrieri, super great driver. He came from Europe too, but he was a lot closer to Formula to One than me. You. I mean, he was like, yeah. he's literally just under it and could have been hired to go to Formula One like the next year. So he's like fully up the ladder. I'm like still at the bottom of the ladder. So they're expecting this guy to probably lead the charge for the team. And I win the first race out been the quickest in testing like I'm ready to rock so I think that dynamic uh shifted very quickly and they were probably surprised by that um but yeah the burden of the you know the year and the potential of what could go wrong went away it no it didn't necessarily I mean it wasn't there in the beginning and he, that's how my dad operated though yeah. and he instilled that into me he was like look if something goes wrong and sideways we'll figure it out yeah and that's what you have to do right if it does go sideways you just figure out a plan to to, to work it out so we went into that year just with you know, just an open mind trying to make it happen. And, and the good thing for me was I knew I was stepping into the best seat on the grid. I mean, it was literally, it was, this was the championship winning team. I'm going to have the best teammates around me to learn from and to, to observe every weekend. Like I, I, it was like a catbird seat opportunity. Was that your first year on the oval? Yeah. First year in oval racing. What'd you think about oval racing? I just loved it. What was I it? loved it. I mean, so y'all ran, I know you run Indy. So we ran where? Iowa. Iowa. Iowa, or I should say Indy was my first one for the Freedom 100, yeah. which was so cool. But you're pretty much wide open, right? Yeah, you're in any lights car at that time. Always wide that, open. Yeah, we're wide open. What about at Iowa? No, Iowa was lifting. you wearing what the tires was, out. I mean, so your first experience in Oval is it's such a crazy discipline. You know, we see it all the time when uh, IndyCar guys come to NASCAR or NASCAR like with Jimmy. Yeah. I mean, it, the disciplines don't even compare, I don't think. Um, watching, totally different. Watching how, you know, each one, each one kind of struggles to understand – uh, the two. Uh, so you go to Oval. I know the other guys are also experiencing this same challenge of racing at an Oval. Um, but tires are wearing out. You're lifting. Um, what was your thoughts like? So Indy was like one part of the equation. You know, it was pretty flat out. You know, as the tires wear out, that gets a little bit harder. You know, much probably like Daytona or something. You know, it's flat out, but it's not easy to keep it stuck, yeah. right? 
And that's how it was. You start learning. It was all about learning drafting, you know, positioning the car, where you want to be, two laps to go, where do you want to be, uh, one lap to go, where you want to be. So that was the whole indie game. Super cool. Um, but then you go to a place like Iowa, totally different. I mean, this is like oval racing. Yeah. You're lifting. You're trying to understand to conserve the tires. You know, how, how does the car feel into the corner, middle, exit, off? Um, and I just I fell in love with it. And mm. short track racing now is my favorite form of racing. I yeah. wish we could race 10 short tracks with Indy cars. <laughs> and it, it's not really possible because our cars can't go to every short track. We sure. can't go to Bristol, no. unfortunately. I wish we could. Yeah. Um, I don't even know how they go around in Richmond would, and places like that. So like, Richmond that and places bonkers. like, yeah, Iowa, Richmond is super fast. But um, with the old surfaces, it works a lot better because we still, we'll drop, you know, we'll probably drop two, three seconds, almost four seconds at Richmond, it'll be about four second drop. So it's a lot of performance loss as the tires wear out. And you're really you're starting to break even with an IndyCar, yeah. which is crazy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's the most fun I've ever had. I fell in love with it. It's a completely different art to race in a road course. I'd never experienced that in my life, um, and I didn't realize how much I was going to love it until until I did it. Yeah, I know you've met, been able to get to know Jimmy a little bit. Let's touch on him for a second. I know you've been able to get to know him. Super awesome dude. I've the touched, best. Yeah, he is such a great guy. Yep. Um, explain to people why it's so difficult for him. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to st start by saying I'm a huge Jimmy Johnson fan. He was one of my guys growing up. I'm someone that loves watching dominance. So when Jimmy was crushing everybody in Cup, <laughs> right, when he had that run, I was like the biggest Jimmy Johnson fan. I would tune in to watch Jimmy crush people. <laughs> so I've got a huge respect for, for, uh, for Mr. Seven Time. Um, what he's doing is it, it's so difficult to describe to people how – how challenging it is. I mean, Jimmy has no background in open wheel racing whatsoever. I mean, he's completely, you know, dirt track racer to, to cup racing, stock car racing. That is that, I mean, it'd be like taking me with no stock car racing background and literally put me in a cup car mm. tomorrow and saying, go run Daytona, go run Richmond, go run Atlanta. It would be so difficult for me to understand how to figure that out. And he's not had a lot of testing. You know, it's it's difficult nowadays to get up to speed. Um, but, yeah, it's all about him trying to understand downforce is probably the biggest thing that he's got to learn. What is the problem with that? So, you know, with an Indy car, we're producing around 5,000 pounds of downforce at 200 miles an hour. Just from a load standpoint, and, you know, I bet a stock car is at 200, you know, fully loaded up on a road course. It's probably 2,200 pounds, maybe 2,500 at most. So it's half of what an Indy car produces. And also the Indy car is half the weight. So dynamically, the way the car feels, the you know how aggressive you need to be on the brake pedal, how aggressive you need to turn the car in, how quickly the car reacts, Jimmy's just not used to that. He's used to a car that reacts a lot slower. The, the way you talk to it, the way it talks to you is like night and day difference to how the Indy car talks. And so he's, I think Jimmy's had to like completely speed up his process. Whereas like an IndyCar guy going to a stock car, they gotta slow it down. They gotta go, okay, let me let me let things happen and talk to the car differently and, and let it all happen. Whereas an IndyCar, it's, it's just happening. It's literally happening and you've just gotta react. So it's not that one's harder than the other. It's not even, it's not even trying to start that conversation. They're sure. just totally different. different. Yeah, so that's the challenge he's working through. And I just, he's getting it. Which Do you is see really these moments of, of, of brilliance or do you see that talent in him shine through yeah. in these little spaces in the races yeah. it's happening in the races um and i think he's just he's got more reps you know as soon as he hits the racing part of the weekend and he's in a rhythm you can see yeah he can drive that car pretty much at the limit but it's the short spurts it's you know getting out of practice doing two laps or going into qualifying having nail one lap like mm -hmm. he doesn't have the confidence yet to just go do it yeah but in the race, when he's like, hey, we got a bunch of time, let's run 70 laps, you can see he's like pretty much on the limit, yeah. you know, and he knows how to drive the car to that limit. So I think once he gets, you know, his head around it, once he gets more confidence, he's he's going to very much be in, in the pack running with it. You know, not as egregious as uh, jumping in a new car, but you guys are about to go do a new track, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in Nashville. Yeah. Like, so, okay, so apply the same type of learning curve. How long will it take? you guys to adapt to a completely new place first off I, okay go that's ahead that's a great i, I saw um <laughs> i don't remember who did somebody went on an old papyrus indie car game yes that was you know 20 years old and did a they made a track out of a program called sandbox of what the the 
the track's going to look like. And um, but anyhow, I'm sure you've seen a better rendition than that. Um, what is this track going to look like? What's it going to remind you of? Uh, everybody's talking about driving over the bridge. Yeah. Um, what kind of what kind of er- what kind of arrow issues does that present? Uh, are you know? When you arch over, you know, going over hills, I know there's a, probably a breaking zone really shortly after the bridge, so you're not yep. going to be like, you know, you're not going to, I don't know what speed you'll be getting to the middle yeah. as you crest that bridge, but what what is that track going to remind people of? So the tough thing about Nashville is typically on street courses, you have the thing fully loaded up with downforce, right? You got the wings cranked up, they're maxed. I mean, it's the most downforce the car will produce because um, that's typically the quickest. You know, you're only probably doing 170 miles, 175 miles an hour on the straight on a street course um, just because it's short. You know, you don't have long straights. It's faster to get through the corners. Mm-hmm. Nashville will propose the question of do we trim the cars out, which is not typical on a street course for us because those straightaways that you're talking about with the bridge, they're, they're super long. Oh. So it actually looks like maybe we should trim the cars out um, just because the the – Trade-off speed-wise seems like it may be worth it. You know, what, how long you're on the straights versus in the corners is starting to propose that question. Um, so I think that's going to be interesting about Nashville. The bridge is by far the coolest part of it. I mean, it's so cool that we're racing over Korean vets, um, which is what, what the bridge is called. It's going to be the perfect backdrop for Nashville. Nashville also has one of the coolest skylines. You yeah, know, yes. I know it very well yeah. growing up. And that, if they get the helicopter shot right, which they, they better do, uh, you're going to see the cars, you know, flying over that bridge, literally right in front of the the skyline of the city. It's gonna it's gonna look aesthetically probably cooler than anything. This Have year. you been down there uh, to the track and as they're putting it together? Yeah, yeah, I've been I've been there working with the track designer Tony Cotman and IndyCar. I just want to make sure we're thinking through everything. Yeah, and what are some of the obstacles? Well, you know, it's a new circuit, so you got to look at runoffs. You got to look at how the pit lanes configured uh i think just even things that people don't think of is like how does the pit lane exit onto the racetrack and how how are the cars coming off pit lane interacting with the cars on the track and in in indycar it's kind of a big deal um you know on a on an oval track in nascar it's not it's not as much of a you know it's not as much of something to think about Mm -hmm. because it's you coming off the apron there's a lot of room on the back stretch it's kind of simple Normally in IndyCar racing, when you come off pit road, the way that it interacts with the car on the track can a lot of times be really tight and really awkward. So you don't want to create problems between that. So there's little things that we just want to make sure, you know, the event has the best opportunity to showcase well off off the jump. Sure. Um, there's going to be problems. It's inevitable. It's a new street circuit. There's going to be things we just couldn't forecast that we got to fix. But I think if we can reduce the amount of issues we have, it's going to help the longevity of the event, you know, yeah. and, and the health of it. Are, are the all the other drivers involved? Uh, not everybody, but you know, I think as long as you've got a couple key people in there that are, you know, giving good advice, um, you know, certainly anyone's advice is welcome. Sure, everyone's running it on the simulator, whether you're a Honda or a Chevy guy. So anyone that runs it on the sim and feels the track and goes, "Hey, I gotta just." Just think about this. I have one point I'd like to say. They're going to take all that into consideration. But it was really important for me. The I wanted to sit down with them, make sure they got some of the details correct. It's wide enough where you can make it wide. You know, thinking about where we could have a traffic jam situation, or you know, where they need safety trucks, just to make sure if there's a track blockage that you can recover those yeah. cars quickly. Because on a street course, if you have a track blockage. You don't want to be sitting there 25 minutes trying to recover the track. It's not good for the fans. It's not good for the driver. Sure. So little stuff like that just needs to be tidied up and made sure. So when you drive over the bridge, um, is there anything challenging about that from a aero standpoint or – not typically. Was, as it's, they, as it's, it kind of crests that heel, I'm sure y'all have all those – have met multiple scenarios like that in, in the series that are similar, but – I keep uh, popping into my mind the long straightaway at Le Mans and the car going, the car, car creating back, lift. Yeah, yeah lifting up. Um, no, it shouldn't be too bad. We're making enough downforce that it should yeah. stay stuck. But the one, uh, the the one section of bridge going over the bridge initially into the downtown area, it's very bumpy off the transition of the bridge, mm-hmm. and then that leads right into a brake zone. So I think the stability of the car is going to be really tough there. Mm-hmm. Figuring out how to get the car, you know, because you're going to want the, you want the car as low as possible. And it's just dynamically the best, but you, I think you're going to have to raise the cars up a bit more in Nashville because it's so bumpy, and the bridge section is very bumpy, so you're going to get some porpoising with the car. So trying to figure out how to how to you know keep that car as low as possible um, while also not crashing yeah. the bumps off of the bridge into the brake zone, that's, that's going to be a challenge. What will they physically need to do to the bridge to be able to race across it? 
Um, so they've they've done a really good job of the the transition from the bridge to the asphalt road. They've repaved all those sections. I, I heard that the track itself took upon that um, expense to repave and patch. You know, I know you're part of the ownership group here. Dave. <laughs> I just watch my Twitter feed, man. I'm, I'm just, just going to say this, though. I think <laughs> what's been most impressive is there's not really been a lot of expense spared yeah. when it comes to... I'm oh, sorry, I just spilled water all right. over here. Yeah. There's not been a lot of expense spared in making sure the track's right. Yeah. And it's really, really important on a street course that you get those details right. So paving that section, you know, some places may not do that. They may be like, well, right. whatever, the cars will it. get used to it. Yeah. yeah, deal with it. But when you, what I was wondering is, like, the bridge is not a racetrack, right? But no. now to make it a racetrack, what needs to happen to the bridge? Is there barriers all the way across well, definitely both need sides? barriers. Right? There's already rails and things. Yep. So not are enough. You can put are a little you more. Is there, is there fencing on both sides? I mean, to keep you guys, you know, from going off into the... Yeah, the good thing is, like, there's a raised-up sidewalk, right? Um, yeah. On the bridge, okay. so the barrier sits on top of that. So the height of the barrier pretty is pretty tall. Yeah, it's pretty tall. It's probably five foot. And then you have the catch fencing all the way up. And so there's catch fencing all the way across the bridge. Yeah, all the way across. And it's the number one question I've got is, you know, hey, you're going over a bridge. Like, what happens if someone, uh, you know, hits another car and they go into go, the water? Yeah. And I just tell people, I'm like, well, there's divers. You know? oh, We're good. I, I said that like, to, I said yeah, that to like my Monaco. wife. I said that to my yeah. wife. She hated that. Yeah. She did not like that response. <laughs> she's she's right, like, by the way. It's like Monaco <laughs> back in the 70s. Exactly. Man. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, look, if we go into the water, they'll they'll come rescue yeah. us. Don't worry about it. It's fine. Oh God. It's making me nervous right now. Just hearing you say it's that. Absolutely uh, you know, not a probable outcome, but the fact that there's this it's a bridge. chance. I mean, the, yeah, we should, it should be discussed. It should be discussed. It should, yeah, it should, it's entered the chat. Yeah. Let's at least acknowledge <laughs> it, right? Yeah. Hey, you, uh, okay, so you've got six races left in yeah. the season. All right. You are, uh, you got some momentum. You've been, you've been running good. You got your win. You're fourth in points. Is Nashville, is, is it considered like, I mean, I would assume it's a wild card a bit because you've never been there. Is that a good thing? Do y'all want us to clean this up real quick? I'll, I'll just figure for him. He didn't want to. He sorry. Didn't want to. Yeah. He's I'm talking sorry. with his hands, and I can see him trying right. to avoid goes, the water over here. He's <laughs> just splash. I'm like, Mike, just it, ignore it the water. Yeah. Hey, you were talking about the bridge and the water, so you're yeah, trying to make it realistic, yeah, man. He, he was you know? doing a real So you can a good see point. Dale's here. <laughs> <laughs> this is now Dale. We're going to go rescue Dale, yeah. okay? It's cool. <laughs> that looks like Driven, the movie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what that's, people have said. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I never thought we would use that movie as an analogy to something that we're talking about here. Uh, okay, so you, uh, you, you've you uh, got six races left, all right? So. Is this a is this a benefit to you to have a wild card race, or is it a bit of a of a of a mind a, a mind Olympic for you to have to? I mean, you having to cut, you having to make up ground. You got Scott Dixon in front of you. You got Alex. You got Pato. Um, is it you know? Is this a good thing to be going to a brand like new it. course? I love it because I, I feel like I can get on top of a new new track quicker than others, and that's a skill set some guys have, right? Some guys. You know, they may take a little while to, to find their footing, but very good. Other guys are just on it right away. I love a new course. I always feel like I can learn it. It goes back to racing in England. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to learn 20 new courses, you know, right off the jump. And so I, I love a new track. I think it provides a good opportunity for us to be ahead of everyone quicker, especially with limited practice time. So that will help us, I think. But, look, you're never guaranteed. You can always have a good weekend going in an IndyCar, and it can be, sure. you know, taken away at the last moment in the race. What a, oh, go ahead, Dan. The, uh, I, the hometown, like, does that matter? Does that is that still a real thing? Are you going to have, like, tons of family in at, at the event? Will, will it be unique in any way because it's in Nashville? It's new for me. I've never had a, the pressure of a hometown event. Will that be there? I think it will. You. I think it will. I mean, I'm already feeling that now because I'm, you know, trying to represent the the event as best as I can. Right. Because I, I want the event to succeed, for sure. not just for Nashville, but for IndyCar. Um, but there's already that hometown pressure of, hey, you're, you know, you're our guy. You're supposed to come in here and do good, right? You're gonna you're gonna be just fine, right? Yeah. So that's gonna be present. Um, but you know, the way I always thought of it was every event's important. This one's no different. So I just. You know, I think of it like any other race. I'm, this one I'm going to try to do. We talked about you being an American overseas, but and 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 I mentioned how multinational IndyCar is, and I think um, you know it's a, it's that's an amazing attribute to that series. What is it like being an American in that series? You know, yeah, you're racing in the United States, you're racing in Nashville at your home track, but you're there are you're the series. 
uh, has been dominated by by you know guys that are that are not American, right? Yeah. Um, oops, sorry. <laughs> Siri. Somebody like, disagrees. I, Siri's like, I don't what know. Siri that. said no, it hasn't. I gotta stop saying series. Uh, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but uh so I think that you know an American star in, in IndyCar is a great thing. I'm sure you feel the same way. Um, how do you feel being that guy? I, you know, it's funny for me, what I what I like about IndyCar racing is that we have the best of the best from yeah. around the world. Um, I think that's what makes it special. I think it's also what makes it special being an American in the sport is that, you know, we've got guys from New Zealand, Australia, England, uh, Europe, Japan, everywhere. You know, they're the best of the best, Brazil. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm part of that group that's representing all yeah. the countries and my country happens to be America. I take a lot of pride in that, but it's also what I like about the championship is that you, you have these guys from different backgrounds that are all coming together to try and, you know, showcase the best from around the world. Yeah. So when I went to, I talked, we talked about this before, Mike, but when I, so I'm watching any car my whole life. Right. And I just, you know, I don't know why I didn't, I'd never really been to a race before. And I go to the Indy 500 and met a lot of the drivers uh, fortunate for me, I got a chance to really get a good glimpse at what that series is like, and I was just shocked by the by the dynamic personalities. Hmm. You know, the NASCAR is a great series, a great sport. We've got great personalities, um, but Mo- <laughs> IndyCar they're from all corners of the world, and while that's an amazing thing for a fan. Uh, what what kind of challenges does that present for you? Because, and I've talked to some other racers about this, like blocking, for example. Mm. You got a different opinion than the guy from maybe Brazil and the guy from Australia well, on what that is. What's a good block? What's a bad block? All those etiquette, all that driving etiquette. I'm sure in road, in you know, in road racing, and and it it, it all kind of blends together. But there's got to be a time when those opinions sort of clash and become difficult because you're you think it was a uh, you think this was a fair decision on the track and this other guy thinks that that's not a good move right when do these things sort of come to a hit yeah i think it's really the cultural differences right like you know what's normal in one culture is different in in america and so i think the you know like someone from france is going to feel differently than someone from america on some type of move and what's the right etiquette or not um, I think for the most part, you know, everyone kind of, you know, we kind of have this international code of, yeah. you know, what's, how should professional open wheel racing be conducted, right? And in IndyCar, we have a certain way of doing that. Um, so everyone that comes over here, we all kind of get on board that same page because the established drivers are going to set that yes. tone and that's what it's going to be. You know, someone, someone coming in may feel differently about that in the beginning, but eventually, you know, you're, you're around the the, you know, the, the predominant players long enough, that's, you're going to have to get used to that. Um, so when you get all of these guys and you have that international code understanding and you take all of you to an oval, and a lot of guys maybe aren't having a lot of oval experience, are the expectations the same? As, do you use that same code? Does it change a little bit? That's, that's actually where it's probably the most different is, you know, the road and street course stuff, I feel like everyone kind of understands that, especially if you're from, you know, Europe or wherever, right. like you kind of get how, how it should work and how we should drive together. When it comes to oval racing, much like me, most of these guys, they don't know anything about oval racing when they come over. Um, and it's not Indy Lights, it's not a junior car. This is like the real deal full-blown Indy car, Indy 500, 33 cars around you. It's serious stuff. And they just, I think what happens a lot of times is they don't understand the respect that's needed at those speeds yeah. and that style of racing. You know, it, it really takes both parties to interact. Whether you're being aggressive or not, like it takes both parties to cooperate in order for it to go okay. Uh, you can't just muscle your way through something, especially on an oval. So that's probably the most difficult thing for anyone new coming into the sport is trying to trying to understand that etiquette and the risk factor there is on, on an oval versus a road or street course. Yeah. What's the international etiquette code for settling disagreements after a race? <laughs> that's the cult. That's where the cultures are, are different. You know, <laughs> yeah. you, you have a little different opinion on how we handle this. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, if you're Will Power, you may fight someone, you know? I mean, he uh, scraps, dude. He doesn't want to fight. He doesn't. It's just part, really? of, his, it's part of his history. You know? It's his else. history. It's he, he. He's a lover. I'm glad you said Will Power <laughs> because, you know, what we really uh, – may I won't speak for you. I'll speak for me. When you were in that iRacing IndyCar race – Oh, God, that uh, was so much fun. And, right. And oh, man, we all raced in Michigan <laughs> or something, and Will Power's in it, and, I, and we're listening to the radio – and I was like, wow, Will Power's a little whiny, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> he, can, he gets a little my, on the chip. He's my favorite person on the planet. He's got to be. I don't even know how to explain that guy to people. Like, he's just we so loved, different. We yeah. loved him. When he was on our show, we just had, and boy, but he likes to scrap. And man, yeah. he doesn't really, I don't know if he thinks he's stealthy with his feelings, but he isn't at I, all. And he, I find Australians very hard to explain, but also some of my favorite people. Yeah. They're, they're, they're my favorite. I have another Australian teammate. Scotty McLaughlin. Yeah. He's another one of my favorite people now. He's from Australia. Well, no, he's actually a Kiwi, but a lot of people think he's Australian. Sure. He's from New Zealand. Yeah, that's delicate. Uh, but he's <laughs> lived in Australia most of his life, so I just think he's Australian. He's going to kill me after he, he is. He is. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Will, you know, what a lot of people don't know about Will is he's like probably the most kind hearted person sure. I've ever met. Yeah. He has such a big heart, but he's so emotional and, and he like, is he's very so emotional. passionate. Yeah. So we've, we've even had our run ins a couple times where he's like, I mean, we've gotten in like yelling matches, and I'm like, I think this guy's gonna punch me for, and I don't know why. I don't know. <laughs> and then literally 20 minutes later, he'll come back and be like, man, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, and we're like best friends again. It's totally fine. Yeah. Um, so there's different cultures for sure, and the way you interact. But at the end of the day, we all we all find a way to get along. Yeah. Which is good. You know, one of the telling things I remember, like watching the Indy 500 this year when Elio won. Like the first people that I saw, and he hugged a lot of people. But the first people, I like Will Power was right there, and I like all of Elio's, you know, Penske teammates were the first to congratulate him, and that really, to me, spoke a lot to the culture of not just your, you know, your driver, you know, fraternity, but also, you know, that the, uh, the captain is built within the company and everything else, and everybody was uh, so generally happy for Elio, as is, you know. Yeah, you know, IndyCar fans, because he's just a likable guy, right? Yeah, I, I think it's the most surprising thing for drivers. I, I don't have the experience on the NASCAR side, so I don't know what that camaraderie is like. But, you know, we're, look, we're all uber competitive people, right? I mean, I want to, same thing with my teammates. I tell this to Scott. I'm like, look, I want to, I'm going to do everything I can to beat you on the track, even though we're, you know, friendly off of it. But what, what drivers notice when they come to IndyCar is they're really surprised by the camaraderie off the track. Yeah. And they, they, they actually, they don't understand how it exists. Mm -hmm. They're like, I don't know how we can all be so cordial and friendly. We don't have to be best friends, but we're all friendly enough where we can hang out in the bus lot or, you know, have a barbecue together or whatever it is and still be as fierce as we are on the track. And I don't know if that's just unique to IndyCar, but we're all, we're really good with each other. Like there's a great camaraderie from, from everybody. So when Elio won the fourth, like everyone was genuinely happy to see Elio do that. It was a big deal for for the series and for him and you know, yeah, I wanted to win the race, but it was it was cool to see Elio do that. Yeah. Yeah, that is an interesting thing about what um and I don't know that IndyCar was always that way. I think it's just it's kind of like a it's it's a trend uh and it had all the all the moons have to align. Uh and right now you guys do have that sort of camaraderie. You can see it in social media where you guys are, you know, genuinely enjoy being around each other away from the racetrack. Um, and I think that's a good thing. You know, we, we talked about it in NASCAR for years that it was maybe a bad thing that all of us were in the bus lot together. Yeah. And we, you know, when we would get into in a disagreement on the track, we would, we would text each other and be, you know, and that would be that, right. There weren't any more scraps and, fighting at the hotel room or the hotel lobby or it was just change you know the ho the the bus lot and us being together all the time sort of normalized us and 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 took away a lot of that really sort of, yeah yeah it took away some of those rough edges but made made us less likely to you know draw out these feuds you know into week and month long deals um, How is it now? Because it honestly seems like from the outside that that's gotten better too, more like the IndyCar world yeah. where everyone, you know, you see these friendships like a Chase and a Ryan sure. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, everyone seems more friendly nowadays. I think so. Um, and I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing that are because you can see those guys also race each other harder than yeah. anyone else on the racetrack. You know, you race your friend, your buddy is harder, harder than anyone else. Mm -hmm. And you actually put him in more compromising situations than you would anyone else, right? Because he's your buddy. He's going to get over it, right? Um, and so at least that's the way I race some of my friends. 
<laughs> I don't know. I think NASCAR drivers, if you really, if they took a lie detector test, I don't think any of them really like each other. I don't know that that. Yeah, I don't know that you're wrong there. And, and I like that. I like it that way. Frankly. I don't. I don't. I think that's important, but I yeah. don't know that the feuds last the way they used to. Yeah, you know, because everybody's in this bus lot together, and they they can't afford to just you know be at each other's throats for for months on end. It, it's a hard thing to do. You know, at the end of the day. I think Will has said this, and I I do agree with it because I'm one of these people that I can be friends with everybody. It's no problem. Like, I'm going to tell you straight up from the beginning, I'm going to do everything I can to beat you on the track. I'm not going to treat you any differently if we're friends. Um, But some people, they just can't do that. When when stuff happens on the track, they they can't get over it, Mm -hmm. and it just changes their dynamic off the track with each other. Uh, I've, I've definitely known a lot of people that struggle with that. So I could see that in the NASCAR world. It seems more likely there yes. that they really struggle with certain things that happen. They they won't get over yeah. it. Um, but IndyCar, yeah, I don't know. It's just a maybe it is the moons aligning. It's yeah. it's a weird dynamic. Everyone's at least cordial, which is yeah. kind of cool. And that'll go away and come back again and go away and come back. Yeah. I think I believe in cycles. Um, your wife was a Disney princess. Yeah, that's so, a fact. Um. Well, you know, I got two little girls getting ready to take them to Disney. Uh, they're going to meet the princesses in in the in the castle. Um, but what wh- does <laughs> what of her like? What are you? Wh- what was her life like as a princess before you met her? I, I don't. You know, was she a, still a princess a, when y'all met? Well, she's my princess for sure. Of course, you know? I'm, um, yes, but a Disney, obviously. Uh, yeah, Disney. It's a weird story. It's kind of like the scooter story. It's like, well. You know, how do you meet a Dis- Disney princess? And I didn't meet her away from Disney and just happen to learn that she was a princess. Like, I met her at Disney when she was a princess. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's how I met my wife. Like, she was literally Ariel. Dude. And I was like, who? <laughs> she was Ariel. I'm like, who is this Ariel? Like, and it, it Joseph wasn't. was looking for he, mermaids. What are you doing at Disney? <laughs> well, I was there with my family. Okay, you're you know, there with your family? How old are you in this moment? 20, 21. All right, and you 21? see... You see uh, you see the princess, right? I see the princess, and you know there's a lot of princesses around. Right. So why are you picking this one out? Of, I mean, she was the one. I'm like, look, I've seen Cinderella, I've seen Jasmine. I'm like, but I don't know who this Ariel person. is. <laughs> and it's not like I had a thing for redheads or something. It wasn't that. It was just what like, was who is this reaction? person? Is this uh, common for her to have people uh, coming up to her and going, <laughs> "Hey, uh, you'd be interested in going on a date"? I mean. It is a weird story. Seems like a thing. Seems Did like you? That would, I'll seems tell you. Like that I'll tell you the story. Awful, awful Wait, living. you didn't hit on her while she was in uniform. I mean, or I did. I oh my did. god, creep! So <laughs> let me let me tell you the story. It's a weird story. Um, so we're at Disney. We were at literally Cinderella's castle. Mm-hmm. They, you can have dinner there. Yes, you can. We were having dinner. You'll probably have dinner there with yes. your little girls. I've already. You got it been scheduled through the up. Process. Yeah. yeah. All, you, oh, all yeah. The, so at this dinner, all the princesses are there. Yep. You know and. Uh, so we're eating dinner, and before this dinner happened, I, we had, you'd like meet Cinderella, and I'm like, oh, this, you know, I was kind of giving her a hard time, just, you know, just playing around, like just you're trying to get them off off balance a little bit because they're they're in character, yes, like they are performing all the time when you see them. So you know, maybe it wasn't the nice thing. I was just trying to get her off balance a little bit. She did sure not that, appreciate I'm sure that. That never happens to them. Yeah, I, all right? the time. They're <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like one in a million. That's like yeah. giving them a hard time. Well, how many 21 year old single guys are going to din- dinner at Disney's, you know, uh, castle? It, a lot more than you think. Really? Uh, a lot more than you think. It's I, like yeah. the guy that goes not to... for that reason. I'm, yeah, not here, I'm not there alone. I'm literally there with seven with other family members. Okay. It's my mom, my okay. dad, my sister, my cousin. I had this visualized completely no, wrong. It's then. not like, hey, table for one, and I'm meeting Cinderella. <laughs> that would be really awkward. Hey, Ariel. What you doing later? Yeah, like what is this? <laughs> that would be creepy. Um, so, anyways, this this Cinderella did not appreciate this. She put me in my place, like super witty, and I'm like, yeah, oh I deserve it probably. Um, so, anyways, then we go up to our table. We're sitting down. We're having dinner, and apparently, like the Cinderella told all the other princesses, they're like, "Look out for this guy. He's you know, he's, he's a tough one, or whatever." <laughs> Am I so Ashley comes over? She's she's the Ariel, and she starts you know giving me giving me a hard time too. And so I just give it right back to her, and I'm like trying to I'm asking her where a prince is. I'm like, where's Eric? You know, he must be on a long, long journey, oh, man. journey far, far away. <laughs> and uh, she's like just struggling. I, I, she 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 tells the story differently. I think she was struggling to stay in character. Um, but I was trying I was trying to catch her off balance too. But she absolutely captivated me. I was like, out of all the, I was like, who, I don't care that you're a what princess you right now. I'm like, who is this girl? So I had to figure out who she was and where she was. 
And that's an impossible task. Yes. You're not just going to leave Disney and go, well, you know, I like that one. Uh, let me let me, <laughs> let me, me see how I can find out her, where her contact is, and maybe I can take her out on a date. Like, it's impossible. They have security for these reasons. Um, so I went back to my hotel, and I'm like, man, I wonder, I, I really want to find that girl. Like, I just got to find her details and, you know, see if I can message her or send her a letter, you know, something cheesy. And um, couldn't find her. Literally at midnight, two hours later, I get an email in my inbox. It's from Ariel. Shut up. I swear to you. I swear to you. She emails me as like this really cute message and How she signed it. How did she get it. your email? That's what I said. I was like, I was like, whoa. First off, I got an email from her. I already know her name now. Now I know who she is. Her name's Ashley. All right. And so I found her online, found out. Yeah, I was Sweet. like. Sweet. I don't have to call her Ariel anymore. Super creepy of me. Um, but yeah, she emails me and I'm like, she must have gotten my email because I made the reservation. I made the reservation for our oh. family. And I'm like, she must have wanted to figure out who I was. I'm like, this is a done deal. She, wa she was curious who I was when I was curious who she was. Mutual. Mutual. I'm like, this is a done deal. This is easy now. I got her information. Anyway, I sent her an email back. She's kind of we're kind of coy with each other. It's like literally taking a day for each email to go. It's like <laughs> sending letters. You know, we're all trying to be cool. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to email too quick. Oh yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> it's like two weeks. You don't want to get give her the wrong impression or anything. No, 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 no. no. Hey, I've already I, hit I, on her at I, dinner. I thought you were interesting, but you know, let me take a couple of days before I email <laughs> I, you back. Right. <laughs> we're both doing this, right? <laughs> trying to be cool with each other. Oh yeah. We literally do it for two weeks, and after the two weeks, I'm like, this is like this is the woman of my dreams. I'm like, who is this lady? And so I. I I was like, I have to come down. Please let me come down and take you out on a date. And so I convinced her to let me do that. I come back down to Orlando, take her out on a date. Um, and then I literally learn on that date that she's moving to Japan. Oh, my. Like in 30 days. It's already done. She's got a contract. She's going to go work for Disney in Japan. I'm like, what the heck? I was like, you're the woman of my dreams. I like want to marry you, and you're going to leave the country? So, yeah. Then I had to go to Japan for... The, the next year, and then the rest is history. Oh, but so yeah, she went. She goes to Japan. She goes to Japan. I had to travel that whole year. How many times did you go to Japan to Three see Three times. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. It's the best time of my life. I love Japan. I wish I could. I, you were going to go to Tokyo yeah. for the Olympics, weren't you? Yeah. I was going to try and weasel my way over there because I'd love to go back to Japan. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. Anyways, we dated while she was in Japan for 14 months, and then the rest is history after that. That's pretty incredible. It's it crazy. is incredible. You want to know the kicker on that story? So it wasn't that she got my email off the reservation. And I didn't learn this until like three weeks afterwards, right? It was my father. My father paid the bill, all right, for the dinner. And he put my, he put my email address down on the bill and gave it to the, the waitress and said, can you please give this to the area? Ariel. The this princess. Is, this is, he saw yes. it. He, oh, yeah. No, everyone at the yeah. table knew. Everyone was like, I'm so infatuated by who this Ariel is. He gave it to the waitress. The waitress gave it to, to Ashley. I think this is probably illegal at Disney. So yeah, hopefully gotta be. this waitress doesn't get, you know, fired one day. But yeah, so my dad ended up being my wingman. I mean, what a guy. <laughs> you know, he gave me my career. He made, he helped me meet my wife. Like Now I know why he gives you so much confidence. I hate it, but I have to give him credit because he did make it happen. That's, Unbelievable. That's Joey Newgarden, man. He's like the he's my guy. There you my go. Gosh. Well, that's pretty incredible. That's a good way to end this conversation, I think. I don't know. Where yeah. do we go from next? I, mean, I don't know. Don't, let's not even try. <laughs> well, Joseph, we um, we had a t we got a ton of notes on you. <laughs> we did. But, uh, didn't get to we hard probably didn't get through half We did it. not. No. And that's the great thing about this podcast is that you don't just come on here once. Dale, when are you coming to Nashville? Uh, I just went like a couple days ago. No, but when are you going? Are you coming for the race weekend or no? I don't know. I have to work that weekend. You got to work that weekend. Y'all are at Watkins Glen yeah, or something. I got to work the broadcast at... Uh, I sent you an email. I'll be down. I got, a, I got a ping pong tournament Thursday night. Bla That's right. Blaney's coming. Magano's oh coming. I'm just saying, if you're open. Oh, this not, is your celebrity it's for charity. Yeah. It's yeah, yeah. for charity. I'll yeah. come. I'm not, I'm not going to play ping you can, pong. You can, can put, just hang out. You can get a ringer. You can hire an Olympian. Yes. You I'll can probably, be your I teammate. Just, I'll, just, I'll just hang out. That's right. You're not, you don't you want to play. play. You don't got to come. You play. You guys play, and I'll I'll. You could be a designated hitter. I'll you mingle. I'll mingle amongst the crowd and say you know say say hey to everybody. What, All right. What is the date of that? It's uh, August fifth, so it's Thursday. It's the only way. It's so Thursday because only way for us to do it. Because, yeah. Because you Thursday. know Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the drivers are busy. Right. So we're doing it Thursday night okay. at six p.m. Yeah. Okay. We're Where gonna have at? tickets for it too. We Where? got hundred tickets. It's at Pins Mechanical downtown Nashville. It's for Serious Fun Children's Network. So people can buy tickets. People can buy tickets. We've never done this before. It's 100 tickets on sale. We're trying to raise an extra $10,000. Awesome. Serious Fun Children's Network, it's part of Victory Junction, is actually in that network. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. Paul Newman's charity that he started in the 80s. It's a really cool group. They do great 
great things for all these kids. How do you get a country. ticket? So if you go to my social media, there's a link to this ticket um, okay. uh, site where you can where you can purchase a ticket. And there's only a hundred, so I don't know how many are left. But okay. if there's still some left, you can buy a ticket and come to the event. All Maybe right. Dale will be there. He's pro- I'm guessing you're probably not, but you may I, be there. I, if I'm, I mean, if I come to the race that weekend, it's definitely got to be Thursday or maybe Friday. But I got to be in the, at the Glen to do the broadcast for the Xfinity race on Saturday and Sunday. I get it. I get it. I'll be standing. You're down. a busy man. I I'll get be it. down in the. I call it the inner loop. Yeah. Or the bus stop, but I, that's where I'll be broadcasting. Oh, for, it, for, it, radio in? style. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's different. But uh, man. Hovis, uh, he left. He had to go yeah. TT. He had to go TT. <laughs> um, he he said, I mean, I've met you before, and I know I know you're a pretty incredible person, man. But he he said you'd be an amazing interview, and you certainly were. Um, people are going to love to hear this podcast. Uh, it's been a blast talking to you and getting to know you, and I'm excited about your future. Thanks for sharing everything with us and uh, being so transparent. Um, people are going to be thrilled to hear it, man. So I hope you had a good time. Man, it's been a total honor. Yeah. I was so nervous to come in here. You know, you guys are like royalty. So. We're, nervous. <laughs> we'll, we're nervous too. But uh, I appreciate it, though. Yeah. This is a, it was a complete honor to be here. Uh, such a big fan of, of you guys and especially you, Dale. Well, I appreciate so, that. Thank you for everything you do for motorsports and, and you know, well, having me on huge, here. We're a huge fan of yours. Uh, we'll be cheering you on going forward. And, uh, yeah, I, we, your grandfather – Ping Pong Hall of Fame. We didn't even get we to didn't that. Even get to that. We didn't so, get to it. There's, so there's Joseph, a lot we could have dug into. Joseph Newgarden, we're going to get him back on the podcast, folks, because he's got a lot more to his story, and hopefully we'll be talking about some more success in your motorsports career, uh, maybe a win in, in Nashville for the first race. So um, good luck going forward, man. Thanks, guys. All Thank right. you. Joseph Newgarden on the Dale Jr. Download. Hey. Awesome. Well, where did yeah. Hovis go? Oh, where is Hovis? <laughs> did he leave? Leave? <laughs> Life is best lived in motion. And that's why Tire Pros gets you ready for all your driving adventures. Whether it's along corners and curves, across city and state lines. Because we're more than just tires. We're auto care too. Tire Pros, so you can focus on the road ahead.